Welcome to our lecture about Internet security. Today we want to speak about weaknesses of Microsoft Windows systems, operating systems, and on Mac OS X operating systems. So we want to discuss some attacks and exploits. In our lecture, we are meanwhile uh, here in the uh, discussion of the weaknesses of operating system. We already discussed weaknesses of Unix, Linux, Star Nix uh, operating systems. We had discussed uh, weaknesses on internet protocols, weaknesses in the design, weaknesses in the implementation, and others. And operating systems are particularly dangerous because they are the basis uh, for all other applications that run on an IT system. In <laughs> If we have a special look to uh, Windows systems, Windows operating systems, then in the early days, Windows uh, had a big problem. Had a big problem because one side, they want to offer very simple uh, to use systems for home user in the operating system for the personal PC. Home user was not a specialist. Uh, was difficult in uh, doing some configuration work. And on the other side, uh, they, they, they offered operating systems for workstations and servers. And of course, with the workstations and servers, there are specialist ways they are able to configure system in a correct way. But in the home, uh, in the easy to use operating system for home users, it was difficult to find ways to support unexperienced users uh, to find the correct configuration. So the first type of the operating system, the easy to use operating systems for home user, they did not incorporate much, uh, for that reason, much of security issues. The second type uh, offered some blends of security for server-based applications. This was uh, the case up to 2001. Uh, in 2001, uh, Microsoft started with uh, Windows XP before Microsoft, before the state, Microsoft did not find a solution, did not find a solution to combine this hardened security with the simplified graphical user uh, interface for this uh, user, for this home users and uh, unexperienced users. And therefore, Microsoft was forced to maintain two different code bases. One side for this easy to use operating systems for home users and others for server. Then uh, in 2001, with uh, Windows XP, for first time, Microsoft was able to offer an easy to use security concise operating system that could be correctly administrated also by non-experienced users. So it's a question of the graphical user interface as a way uh, to present security features, to explain security features so that even unexperienced users are able to uh, make the correct decisions. While Windows XP is much more secure than all its uh, predecessors, uh, its desktop predecessors, it has also a, a lot of security, uh, uh, security vulnerabilities and leaks, similar like the Unix uh, and Linux operating systems. But one has to state clearly uh, the situation, the security situation, the amount of attacks against this uh, desktop, uh, this desktop operating systems from Microsoft did a big improve. Uh, with in uh, introduction of uh, Windows XP uh, in uh, concern to security. For the various discussions uh, of the security leaks and the possible attacks that are based uh, on this for the older Microsoft versions, you can have a look uh, to our Teletask archive. Uh, so Today, I want to discuss only Windows XP uh, system, the older uh, desktops version, and a big amount of security leaks of vulnerabilities of the older Microsoft systems you can find in lectures uh, recorded in uh, Teletas uh, archive. 
Then in this lecture, we also want to discuss uh, uh, the uh, Mac operating system 10. This is one of the Apple's uh, Mac operating systems. It is widely deployed uh, in computer systems of Apple Incorporation, and it also it provides also the basis of iOS, uh, the operating system that's used by uh, iPhone and iPad. In the moment when such a system becomes more and more popular, then it becomes more and more attractive for attackers. So also here uh, we see that also this uh, Mac OS 10 system has vulnerabilities uh, that can be misused for break-in or for uh, denial of service attacks or others. But let's start the lecture. So in this lecture we focus uh, uh, on attacks on Windows system, Windows operating systems. We start with a focus on Windows client side systems and later uh, we will discuss weaknesses in Windows Server and in Mac OS, Mac OS 10. Mac OS 10, uh, it's very similar, it's based uh, in, in the, the construction and the design on the Starnix systems. So all what we discussed in the, in the former lecture about weakness and vulnerabilities of Unix systems, Linux systems, this also uh, applies to Mac OS 10 system. So let's start first with uh, attacks on uh, window clients. What we discuss in this lecture are so-called SMB attacks, SMB relay attack, the RPC, remote procedure call attack. We discuss the Vista speech control attack. Uh, we discuss attacks based on the universal plug and play uh, mechanism so-called UPnP attacks and uh, uh, the remote desktops attacks, abusing the remote desktop, abusing remote assistance. So these are attacks on the Windows client side, and later in the lecture we will discuss uh, attacks against Windows Server. So here we first have to remember the Kerberos authentication mechanisms and then we will discuss Kerberos authentication attacks. We will see how uh, systems to prevent buffer overflow uh, can be uh, misused for attacks, so the defeating buffer, flow, uh, uh, overflow, buffer overflow prevention. Of course, I can only give a few examples, so who is interested? For more reading, I refer to the textbook Security Warrior uh, from Peikari and Shuvaki, uh, published by O'Reilly. And uh, several issues concerning the weaknesses of Mac OS, uh, Mac OS 10 conclude the lecture. Concretely, we will discuss about the first OS 10 warm ever, so as 10 leap.a, and we will uh, uh, shortly introduce a root shell exploit uh, for Tiger 10.4 uh, and Leopard 10.5 uh, versions of the uh, Mac operating system. So let's start with attacks, looking uh, to some attacks uh, on Windows client systems. And first attack, uh, first family of attacks we want to discuss are so-called SMB attacks. SMB, that's a service, a service message block. It's also called common internet file system. Uh, and this is a network sharing protocol. The SMB protocol is used uh, so that uh, shared access is possible to files, to printers, to serial ports, and uh, for misangelous uh, communication between computers on a network. For that reason, we, one needs, or the SMB protocol is designed to support this. The SMP, SMB protocol is often used uh, as an application layer or a presentation layer protocol, but it relies on uh, different combinations of lower level protocols for the transport.
So, for example, via NetBIOS um, RP, uh, the, uh, Net, uh, um, the NetBIOS extended user interface, which in turn can run on several transports. It can be based on UDP protocol and then uh, use UDP port 137, 138, and it can be used uh, uh, with TCP, and then the ports 139 are used, or the protocol can be used directly over TCP, and then port 445 uh, is used uh, at least since Windows 2000. Or finally, in several legacy protocols, such, such, such as N, B, F, I, B, X, uh, SNA and others. So there are different uh, situations, different combinations where the SMB protocol is used. In Unix or in Unix-like systems, uh, usually they use Zamba uh, for uh, such an SMB protocol. Zamba is a free software implementation of SMB uh, protocol. The latest stable release is version 4 uh, for uh, zero, 00 from a uh, few days ago, from uh, December uh, 2012. While other systems can also use SMB protocols, security accidents about SMB on Windows uh, operating systems have been very often operated. So in this, the use of SMB in the, in the Microsoft system, in the Microsoft uh, uh, operating systems, uh, Windows, that is uh, commonly known. So I will uh, introduce only a few of these uh, protocol, few of these examples of attacks that are based on misusing the N, uh, SMB protocol and I concentrate on the following uh, situation. We only consider uh, NetBIOS uh, over TCP IP, that's the NBT, and uh, with ports 137 to 139. And uh, we uh, consider T SMB over TCP with uh, the port over the port 445. So this is, I mentioned there are other constellations possible, but in the following, uh, the uh, following, I, I fix this, uh, uh, I fix this uh, constellation uh, to introduce some uh, attacks. Some of the Windows SMB implementations are vulnerable, to, are vulnerable to the following attack. First is the SMB relay attack. SMB relay attack is a reverse attack on the SMB protocol. SMB operates uh, in a, a client-server manner. That means requests are, uh, requests are sent, responses are given. And uh, while the Windows could run without allowing SMB requests, uh, this is uh, set up in the default settings. So one can switch off this mechanism, but in the default setting, these uh, SMB uh, services are uh, uh, available. So a remote client can check whether the SMB service is available. It can check is because uh, the ports are known, so it's a simple port scan uh, that needs to be performed. Port scan on the ports 139 and uh, 445, and in this way the remote host uh, can very easily detect whether an SMB service is available. The vulnerability I introduce uh, to you is mentioned and referred in the Microsoft Security Bulletin uh, MS0867. Uh, uh, this is a series of uh, reports on on uh, uh, vulnerabilities of uh, the Microsoft system uh, reported by Microsoft. The systems that are, vulnerable, that are vulnerable against these attacks are Windows 2000, SP4, XP, SP1 to SP3, uh, Vista, SP1, Windows Server 23, and uh, uh, 2008. And this is the idea of this SMB attack. 
the SMB relay attack. The SMB relay attack abuses a vulnerability in the handling of the NTLM. NTLM is the anti LAN manager. And the abuse uh, is concentrated on abusing the NTLM credentials. And here is the attack scenario. The attacker starts such a malicious SMB server and then uh, he uh, waits for connections. The target client connects to the uh, malicious server and sends his NTLM credentials to the server. And the vulnerability is that uh, it is possible that the attacker to relay these credentials back to the target, and in this way uh, he can uh, uh, get access to the uh, target system uh, and remote code execution is possible uh, in the context of locked on users. So using these credentials that are sent to the servers, uh, these credentials can be misused to get rights to perform remote code uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the system of the target uh, victim. What are the protective measures against such SMB uh, relay attacks? First, remove NetBIOS uh, from any network card or modem connection. This eliminates the possibility of abusing SMB. Uh, one can do this simply uh, by means of programs like SMB Nuke. Another protective measure is the installation of an according patch uh, that's available from Microsoft. And the uh, third protective measure I want to mention is shutting down the LAN manager, uh, the LAN manager services. Uh, so this secures the server, but on the other side, it also disables the, uh, the file sharing, the print sharing services, and others. So the SMB protocol was introduced to support this, and if you switch off, you can increase security, but you lose comfortability. A second uh, attack uh, here uh, uh, on the base of the SM or in the context of uh, using the SMB protocol are RPC attacks. RPC remote procedure call attacks. Uh, there is an exploit uh, of a very critical vulnerability in the Windows RPC interface. RPC remote procedure call uh, that's used over SMB and uh, it offers possibilities for file sharing and printer sharing. So Windows uh, Server Services provides the RPC interface and then it opens the corresponding ports, for example, 135. The uh, remote procedure call interface is accessible by default when file or printer sharing is enabled. Yeah? Otherwise, it becomes difficult. So this vulnerability what is that which is called SMB credential reflection uh, vulnerability is referred also in the Microsoft uh, security boletons. It is referred in uh, MS 08068 uh, and in the public vulnerability database, vulnerability databases, uh, CVE, uh, and also you see here this OA, uh, 08. Uh, that's uh, short for 2008. This was a year where this was discovered. So the vulnerable systems are Windows 2000, SP4, XP, SP1 to SP3, uh, Windows Server 2003, SP2, Vista SP1, Windows Server 2008. So these, uh, syst these systems are available against the following attack. The RPC attack scenario works as follows. The Microsoft SMB protocol handles this NTLM, this NT-LAN manager credentials, when a user connects to an attacker's SMB server. This was the same like in the SMB relay attack. So the attacker then 
is able to compromise the binaural system by sending specially crafted RPC requests. For example, in which uh, the attacker replay a user's credentials. So a user opens doors and allows uh, the attacker uh, to uh, perform a remote code, to execute code, and uh, the right to do this, the attacker gets via misusing the uh, NTLM uh, uh, credentials uh, from the user himself. Protective measures against this RPC attack are shut down Windows uh, server service, enable firewall to block uh, traffic, particularly on the ports 139 and 445, and uh, the installation of according security patches, uh, which are available from Microsoft. So this uh, concludes the two, uh, the two SMB attacks I want to introduce to you. Next uh, attack we want to discuss is the Vista speech control attack. So Vista speech control attack can lead to remote comment execution. And the idea is very simple. The Vista speech controls uh, uh, allows that a PC can be controlled uh, by uh, spoken comments. So one can, instead of typing in uh, the comment, one can speak with the PC and uh, the Vista speech control makes it possible that system understands the comment and then performs it. So with the running micro and uh, speakers, as well as the enabled speech control feature, Vista becomes vulnerable uh, to remote comment execution. And it's very simple. Uh, record a sequence of, 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 uh, of, of comments and then simply play the sound file with spoken malicious comments. So one can misuse this uh, audio interface, this uh, Vista speech control, simply by uh, record a dangerous series. For example, uh, one can uh, uh, force a system in this way to offer a link to a browser and uh, then uh, to, to a malicious browser or uh, other things. And then the PC uh, can be used to execute arbitrary uh, comments. Protective measures are, of course, disable speech control. Then this simple way of attacking in a, in a Windows Vista system uh, 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 cannot be performed. The next family of attacks are the UPnP attacks. UPnP is a universal plug and play, plug and plug and play uh, technology, which was introduced with Windows ME, and the idea was to make it more easy for the user uh, to install new devices to make it more convenient because for her it was difficult to find, to, to bring, to uh, adjust the system in the right way and uh, to um, give the corresponding uh, uh, data in. So here the plug and play technology allows that the systems, the, the devices that are connected to the system are able to uh, connect themselves and to configure the uh, overall system in the right way. The idea this UPnP technology is based on is the following. If a new UPnP device connects to a network, it sends a notify, it sends a notify signal to all <coughs> other devices in the network, and in this way it tells that it is online and that it's ready for use. So this is done by means of the notified uh, uh, signal. The notified signal mainly contains an URL, and in this URL, uh, the other UPnP devices can get all the information about this, uh, uh, this new device. So in this way, this URL that gives other European, uh, UPnP devices the possibility to determine which uh, services are offered by this 
plugged in a new service, uh, plugged in new device. Then communication is realized by the SSDP protocol, the simple service, simple service discovery protocol, and uh, the uh, work uh, is done in the following. Beside of this notify signal, the UPnP devices sends out also a signal that it's known as mSearch. And mSearch is uh, needed or is uh, the uh, signal that the new device wants to know what other devices are, what other services are already plugged in, what other services are already available. So with mSearch calls all the other UPnP, uh, UPnP devices that are connected to the network to send back an information about service they are offering so that also the new device knows what kind of service are uh, available in the network. Theoretically, this mechanism can be used to set up an appliance network to control and regulate all electric devices uh, in house. Yeah, this is the idea to have such a simple mechanism. Windows XP enables this feature by default. And it was discovered that the UPnP technology is vulnerable to uh, several denial of service attacks. Yeah, so this mechanism, this notify and this M search mechanism uh, can cause traffic, can uh, give wrong information about the service that's offered and others. Beside that denial of service uh, attacks, uh, UPnP also allows attacks based on privilege elevation and XSS cryptside uh, scripting using Java uh, script flash to open backdoor ports uh, and uh, I will show you a concrete attack scenario about this. UPnP mainly used for remote configuration uh, of port forwarding uh, for home servers uh, in a NAT environment. To give you an example, if the peer-to-peer -peer clients, for example, for file sharing, uh, 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 need direct connection. So NAT must be bypassed. NAT was this, uh, this address, this dynamic address allocation, must be bypassed by means of port forwarding from home router to client PC. Now the applications say request ports and forward rules from router via UPnP commands. So the attack idea is that attacker forces the client PC to invoke a in UPnP and open a port. For example, for a backdoor shell, a file server, or a remote desktop without user interaction or any other additional knowledge. So it's automatically uh, forced that uh, the PC, uh, uh, the, the attacker forces the victim's PC to invoke such an uh, UPnP uh, to open ports and then can do things. Let's have a closer look. For example, a website that's prepared with JavaScript or with ActionScript inside uh, such a flash clips after the victim visits the website, the script will run uh, in the uh, victim's PC. Now, the effective implementation of Flash Player and JavaScript interpreter engine allows scripts to call functions outside the runtime uh, environment, outside their runtime and uh, runtime context. Then this is what it makes uh, what it makes uh, so dangerous. So scripts can act as local applications. The applications are allowed to request port mapping, uh, and this uh, via UPnP. That's a feature, and uh, exactly this is misused because in this way the attacker can open any port 
to any host within the internal network. So he can get remote access, he can set up a ROS server or other things. So this is what this UPnP uh, technology makes uh, dangerous in the implementation uh, that's, uh, that one can find with the Windows operating systems. What are the protective measures? Protective measures are, of course, uh, install uh, available patches, disable UPnP uh, on uh, the router if it's not needed. That's the general rule. If you do not need a service, if you do not need a method, a technique, uh, a service, then disable this to uh, close, uh, to, to shut down the possibility that attacker can misuse exactly this as a uh, vehicle for an attack. A few remarks. This uh, vulnerability is Windows specific. Is Windows specific, Linux or uh, OS X browsers or Flash players have not been affected. So this is something, uh, this type of attack uh, is an attack uh, that's possible only uh, against uh, Microsoft systems. A reason, uh, a reason in designing this UPnP tech technique and mechanisms was is and this was criticized by security experts from the beginning of uh, designing the service is that the UPnP technology, there is no authentication mechanisms. So there's start with influencing, with opening, with forcing uh, things to do, to install. The idea was to make it easy, but there are no uh, uh, authentication mechanisms to find out who forces some of these uh, activities. So in this way, the malware like Torianian or, or Worms could easily work in the net environment because they can open ports uh, via UPnP. Let's have a look to another family of attacks. Uh, let's have a look to app using remote desktop. Uh, uh, the, the remote desktop attacks. Uh, the integrated remote control is one of the most useful features of Windows XP. So this allows to uh, connect uh, and to control an, a, a system uh, in a distance. However, this, since the release of XP, Several security uh, security issues affiliated to this uh, to this service uh, are uh, discovered and discussed. So the remote desktop features repeals the need for third-party remote control programs. So the remote desktop, that's the idea, allows an authorized user, remote user. To connect from a distance uh, from a distanced system, this works on a direct connection. A direct connection is needed. So, if there is any firewall or proxy on the direct path uh, between the, uh, the remote user and the system, uh, then this firewall needs to be configured in such a way that it allows the use of remote desktop. The connections, the remote desktop connection is uh, uh, protected by a username and password. Hence, security of the remote desktop depends on the strength of the password. We already discussed password security. Also here is an example that in very helpful but in bad hands, a very dangerous service is uh, secured, is protected by a username password. Here is an attack scenario that's uh, misusing this, uh, this uh, remote desktop uh, serv service. The attack scenario uh, works as follows. The attacker finds a computer that accepts remote desktop connections. 
since this is easy, since remote desktops run on dedicated ports that support uh, 3389, this can to find uh, in a system a computer that accepts uh, remote desktops can easily be found by port scanning. Then a hacker opens a remote desktop session, <clears throat> for example by means of Microsoft's TS web application or by Linux uh, our desktop. Uh, this is easy uh, to script. When the password prompt is displayed, a hacker can execute a brute force tool. Brute force tool like a TS crack is a little bit outdated, so it works uh, maximally up to uh, Windows uh, 2003 server. Or one can manually test uh, the most common passwords. Uh, you remember uh, is the access list of the most uh, commonly used passwords and the attacker in this way can easily by hand, by hand try out password to get in and misuse the desktop remote uh, uh, service. Another, in this family, another attack is the app use of remote assistance. As remote assistance, uh, this is a service that works very similar to remote desktop but it allows two connections to computer at the same time. And the idea behind is that typically this is a service offered to beginners so that the beginners uh, can get help by an, a technic in, uh, uh, by a technic. The difference between a remote desktop and a remote assistance is remote desktop is protected by password remote assistant is not. So it can be uh, a cause even more security problems than remote uh, desktop uh, service. If we have a look to an attack scenario uh, that uh, shows how to misuse the remote assistant, then the remote assistant file is nothing more than an encrypted link encrypted link and this encrypted link is sent in plain text to the second partner. Hence, by means of a sniffer, uh, one can, uh, one attacker can see the link and uh, the attacker can recreate the link and connect to the first computer instead of the technique. And there is no password protection uh, or others. So, for example, by social engineering, the attacker could try to get full control of the, uh, uh, of the PC, of the beginner, and then install a backdoor or whatever he wants to uh, do to also in future get information, secret information from this computer or uh, provide uh, him possibilities for break-in or others. So these are remote uh, desktop attacks that are uh, based on the remote assistance service. <coughs> Let's now have a look to uh, Microsoft Windows Server Systems. I already mentioned uh, before we discussed uh, Microsoft Windows Operating Systems on client side. And uh, now let's have a look on uh, Microsoft Windows Server operating systems. This server are Microsoft's contender against Unix in the server market. The current Windows.net server versions, <coughs> like for example Windows 2003 server, <coughs> they are re-engineered from a Windows 2000 server. <coughs> And uh, there was a famous, uh, famous memo uh, from Bill Gates, this trustworthy computing memo. And here Bill Gates stated that the success of Windows Server will strongly depend on how the user perceives security of the uh, server operating systems. And this memo was a signal for a very complete change 
uh, in the uh, in the Microsoft how Microsoft uh, people are thinking engineers are thinking about security so from this point on the security was uh, very much in the center of uh, thinking uh, how to implement uh, operating systems how to run how to provide services uh, and others so with the Windows 2008 server uh, a new core architecture was introduced uh, which brings uh, which brought new uh, security features but this is not widely used uh, yet such server installation are very expensive so it needs uh, times it needs years uh, to uh, uh, install this uh, in in all the uh, productive IT systems let's start with have a look on the security mechanisms of uh, the Windows servers and this is the uh, Kerberos authentication so Kerberos was not designed by <coughs> uh, was not designed by Microsoft I uh, say a few words about history later but Microsoft used this security protocol the Kerberos version 5 protocol in its implementation so this is the default network protocol for authentication uh, protocol for authentication within a domain in Windows 2003 server the Kerberos protocol originally was developed in uh, the 80s in MIT uh, and uh, the project <coughs> where the Kerberos protocol was developed was named Athena and this Athena project had three goals to provide authentication service to provide authorization service and to provide auditing services but at the end the uh, the project ended with uh, developing designing proposing only first goal an authentication service uh, that uh, was implemented the name of the protocol the Kerberos uh, came from the Greek musical uh, the Kerberos was a three-head dog and uh, which <coughs> which uh, guards the entrance uh, of Hades and the three heads correspond to the authentication the uh, authorization and the auditing which were the goal uh, of this uh, project Microsoft implementation of this <coughs> Kerberos includes all three heads includes authentication authorization and uh, auditing <coughs> this Kerberos implementation uh, and the Kerberos protocol provides a strong authentication method for a client server uh, application environment uh, in such a uh, client server distributed environment and uh, the security is provided by shared uh, by shared uh, secret key uh, cryptography and uh, multiple validation technologies I want to remind you to this techniques so the Kerberos uh, version 5 protocol verifies the identity the identity of both partners in this client server interaction so the user of the network service and the provider of the network service so here we have the Kerberos version uh, 5 a mutual authentication mechanism Kerberos runs in a system <coughs> uh, of uh, tickets issued by a key distribution center KDC, KDC, Key Distribution Center. So to gain access to a network resource, to a network service, a ticket is needed. A ticket is needed for authentication. So the, the Key Distribution Center, this is the intermediary party in this scheme uh, and runs as a service on Windows 2003 server uh, domains by default every uh, Windows 2003 server uh, domain controller is such a uh, key distribution center 
And the purpose of this KDCs is to grant initial tickets, to grant initial tickets and ticket granted, granting tickets, that are the TGTs, uh, to so-called principles. And principles that are machines, that are users, that are services, that are applications. So to get access, I need, uh, I need tickets for authentication, I need an in initial ticket, and uh, I need uh, users need uh, ticket granting tickets, and uh, the key distribution center is responsible to provide this. Presenting such a pre-shared secret uh, allows the uh, principals uh, to get a unique TZG a unit ticket granting ticket that uh, allows him to make use of these uh, resources. The, <clears throat> to provide the service, the key distribution center is uh, comprised of two components. There is an authentication service and there is a ticket granting service. AS, TGS, Ticket Granting Service, and Authentication Service. The Authentication Service, that's the first activated when the user logs in to the network. So uh, uh, the Authentication Service provides the user with a login, a temporary session key, the session key is encrypted, and a ticket granted ticket granting ticket. The authentication service response includes two copies of the session key. One is encrypted with a, a ticket granting service key located in the TGT, in the ticket granting ticket, and the other uh, is encrypted with the user's key and the user's key, that's mainly the password. This shared session key between the user on one side and the ticket granting service on the other side enables a single sign-on capability of Kerberos. Single sign-on, not to every time for every new service, uh, a new uh, authentication authorization is needed. So it's organized in a, uh, in a single sign-up uh, sign manner. Here is a, a sequential process of authentication. It starts that the principal, principal that's the computer, the resource, that's the user, uh, is that the principal first makes an authentication service request to the, uh, to the key distribution center to get such a TGT, ticket granting, ticket granting ticket. The key distribution center responds to the client with such a, a ticket granting ticket, and this ticket granting uh, ticket includes a key, that it is a ticket session key, and <coughs> the uh, and the TGT is encrypted with the client's password. So other network, uh, other users of the network uh, uh, cannot understand this. Then the client uses this ticket granting ticket uh, he receives from the, uh, or, or it receives from the key distribution center, and now he requests a ticket granting service ticket in order to access uh, another principal. For example, a resource, a file, another user, a server. Then, the key distribution center responds to the client by issuing such a ticket granting service ticket to the client to, assess, to, ass, to give him the possibility to access, to access a specific resource in the server. Here again, a session key is generated and two copies are made. One for the application server. Uh, this is encrypted with a key, with a ticket, uh, of the application server and the other uh, for the user and this is encrypted with the session key from the, uh, from the authentication service exchange in the beginning. Next step, client presents the ticket 
as a request to the server, and uh, the server authenticates the client, and uh, he knows the ticket, and then uh, the mutual authentication uh, is specified, uh, the client uh, shows uh, his ticket, and then he can access to the resource. So this is the uh, ticket granting service mechanism. Uh, the secret or the, the security level comes from the knowledge of the shared session between the user on one side and the service provider on the other side and the mutual authentication. Both parties can prove to know the shared key. Uh, they can do this, for example, by the following procedure. Uh, generating a random number X, then, uh, then uh, encrypting, uh, sending this number X in an encrypted form, uh, encrypted with the session key uh, to the other party, then the other party, if it's the right one, uh, they share and know the session key, then they are able to, uh, to uh, decode this and can respond to prove that they are able to decrypt, that they are able to find what was X, they send back X plus one. And then both sides know, uh, okay, this communication does only work if both have the same shared key. The mutual authentication prevents such man in the middle attacks. So it's a very uh, sophisticated security mechanism. Before we discuss some attacks for uh, vulnerabilities for this Windows Kyberos uh, implementation, I want to shortly uh, explain the way how a principal can access uh, to a service in another domain. How to get access to resources from an entirely different domain. Uh, what I described with this Kyberos service is working inside one domain. So inside one domain, we have seen how uh, one can, uh, a principal can get secure access uh, to a resource in that network, but how to uh, authenticate uh, against an, another uh, security domain. To this end, why, um, a Windows Kerberos implementation allows so-called Kerberos referrals. Basic idea is that <clears throat> the client first receives a ticket granted ticket from the uh, key distribution center in its own domain. Let's call it domain one. Since this ticket granting ticket only works within the current uh, domain, the key distribution center from domain one issues to the client a new ticket granting ticket that provides authentication of the KDC. Uh, that provides authentication to the key distribution center of the NASA domain. Let's call it domain two, where the client wants to get access uh, uh, and wants to access a resource. The client in domain one wishes to access now a network resource in the remote uh, domain two. The client has already been authenticated by the key distribution center in domain one and has received uh, the uh, ticket granting ticket uh, with uh, information from the uh, key distribution center of domain two. So the client now presents this ticket granting ticket to the KDC in domain one, requests the ticket granting service to access remote network resources in domain two. The key distribution center in domain one cannot provide this ticket granting service uh, to the resource in the domain two, uh, and so it, uh, it uh, uh, responds with a ticket granting ticket to give the principal access to the domain two. This ticket granting ticket is presented by the, uh, by the principal to the key distribution center of, uh, in domain two. And the key distribution uh, center in domain two, if it has authorized, uh, if it has 
uh, authenticized the client, then this uh, key distribution center is able also to uh, give ticket granting services. So key distribution center in domain two now responds with a ticket granting service for the requested network resource because KDC in domain two is able to do this. So this is the cross-domain network uh, resource mechanisms uh, for uh, Kerberos in the Windows uh, uh, world, in the Windows operating uh, world. So the client now can access the resources in domain two uh, with this new ticket granting service in a similar way, in a similar way, like in its own uh, security domain. What are the weaknesses in this Kerberos protocol? You have seen it's a very sophisticated uh, protocol that provides a high level, really high level uh, of security uh, for the uh, for the Windows servers. So if one compares this security services, authentication, authorization, auditing service with former mechanisms used by older uh, server, Microsoft server uh, operating systems, then this Kerberos mechanism brings a really drastic improvement in the security. Uh, old systems use this NT-LAN, this NTLM uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, a LAN manager, and we already discussed weaknesses of this. So with this Kerberos, it's really improved. However, Kerberos, as the protocol and the implementation in the Windows server is still vulnerable. And uh, if you have a, a look to the protocol side, it is long time known that Kerberos 5 has a vulnerabilities to offline password guessing attacks. This was already mentioned uh, in an RFC uh, 1510. The problem results in the fact that it is possible uh, to obtain material um, of, for password verification uh, and decrypt timestamps in a simple way. And here is the attack scenario, uh, how to get such password verification material. In Kerberos 5, a login request uh, contains pre-authentication data that's used for uh, verifying the user's credentials when a ticket granted ticket is issued. The basic pre-authentication pre scheme used by uh, Windows servers and other Kerberos implementations contain an encrypted timestamp and a cryptographic checksum. Both are encrypted with a key that's derived from user's password. The format of the used timestamp is year uh, for uh, um, digit year, months, day, hours, minutes, seconds. That and prior to the encrypted. Uh, the encryption. So the encryption, if I encrypt such type of information, uh, one gets a structured plain text that can be used to verify a password attempt. If you remember when we spoke about password and revealing password security mechanisms, if I have an understanding what is the semantic of a certain string, then I can use this even if the string is encrypted to find out what is the original information. So the password attempt that recovers a plausible uh, timestamp can also be verified by computing the cryptographic checksum and then comparing it to the one that comes from the pre-authentication uh, mechanism. There is a detailed description in the public uh, Brizak internet draft a detailed description uh, on how the RC4, this was a hash function, the RC4 key uh, is derived from user's password as well as a pseudo, pseudo code for decrypting and verifying the timestamp. So from this pre, from this secrets in the pre-authentication phase, 
they can also, they are uh, uh, transported uh, merrily in an encrypted way. They provide, there they, they are possibilities uh, to decrypt it. Here it is shown and described that it's not necessary to compute expensive embedded cryptographic checksum to verify a password. It suffices to decrypt it and search for an ASCII string that looks like a timestamp. And this looks like this comes because one knows the structure of this encrypted uh, information. What are protective measures against uh, this uh, attack? Password-based login is not the only way, it's not the only option provided by Kerberos uh, 5, nor uh, its in implementation for Windows Server. So Kerberos 5 protocol as well as the Windows implementation of Kerberos work also with a public key, uh, with a public key a scheme. Uh, one needs in that way a public key infrastructure, so the PKI NIT, which does not suffer from that problem, from that problem I showed you, because in the asymmetric uh, way there is not so necessary to have a pre-shared uh, a pre-shared secret. Another uh, attack family I want to introduce, attacks, security attacks against Windows Server, are uh, defeating the buffer overflow prevention mechanism. So in 2003, a method was discovered to exploit buffer overflow prevention system in Windows 2003 server. So Buffer overflow we have already discussed is a very dangerous attack. So the Windows uh, engineers, the Microsoft engineers were thinking and designed a method to uh, prevent such buffer flow. And this prevention system, this buffer overflow prevention system is <coughs> implemented in the Windows 2003 server. The problem here uh, that attackers are able to misuse uh, this uh, mechanism is that the window stack, uh, that the, the problem lies in the way how the window stack is uh, uh, protected, uh, uh, how the window stack protection uh, mechanism is designed. To prevent such buffer overflow, the idea uh, that was uh, incorporated by Microsoft's uh, engineers is the following. The, to close the risk of a buffer overflow vulnerability, uh, they have uh, designed the following mechanism. When a function is called a security cookie, a so-called canary, is placed on the stack in front of the saved return address. You know, in the stack there is a return address, and the idea of the buffer overflow is attack to override this return address uh, by, another, uh, by another address that point to some executable code. So if this is a prevention, this idea of the prevention mechanism, if the buffer over, uh, this is a buffer uh, uh, local to that function, if this buffer is overflowed, then the cookie needs to be overwritten when attacker try to override the return address. So they are not able only to override the return address, they also override this cookie, this security cookie. And to prevent buffer overflow before function is uh, uh, returns, the cookie is checked. The cookie is checked against uh, authoritative version uh, of the cookie uh, that cookie is stored in the data section uh, of the module where the function recedes and before the function is executed it is checked whether this cookie uh, agrees with the cookie that's stored on the on the function side if yes if yes then there was no uh, buffer overflow uh, attack and if yes then the system stops the function 
uh, the function is not executed because then one can assume that uh, there was a buffer overflow attack. So if the cookie does not agree, if it's not match, the system terminates the process uh, in order to prevent uh, a possible buffer overflow. So what is the possible attack scenario? The attack scenario is, in any case, the cookie is overwritten. So what the attacker try to do is the corresponding cookie in the data section, the memory data section, to adapt to the new one uh, that uh, is new uh, in uh, resulting from the overflow. This memory section, where this, uh, where this counterpart this for, for uh, checking whether the two cookies agree, this uh, data section is writable. So, and this makes it vulnerable to attacks by overriding the authoritative cookie with a known value uh, and then overriding the stack cookie with the same value. And then if the function uh, takes the, uh, the cookie and checks it against the authoritative cookie, and if the authoritative cookie is also manipulated, then they agree and the, uh, the, uh, the function uh, is performed. What are the countermeasures against this attack uh, to defeat the buffer overflow prevention mechanisms? The recommendation of Microsoft is to mark the 32 bits of this memory uh, where the cookie is stored as read-only. <coughs> then attacker cannot uh, override the authoritative uh, cookie and then uh, they cannot hide that uh, the buffer was overwritten. Let's have a look uh, to, uh, uh, to the Microsoft, to, to, to the Mac uh, operating system 10. I already uh, mentioned that uh, all this, this uh, uh, very popular operating systems uh, are very attractive for attackers uh, to attack the operating system because it provides a basis for all the services, for all the applications that uh, are provided by a system. So besides of, of Linux and Microsoft operating systems, we have also to look uh, to this uh, uh, OS X systems. As a general remark, uh, we have to see, and for that reason I w will not uh, speak too much about this Mac OS system, the, Mac, the core of the Mac OS system is in a Starnix adaption, a Unix, uh, it's, it's based on the ideas of Unix. That means all the vulnerabilities we discussed uh, in Unix system and uh, Linux systems, all the vulnerabilities of the Starnix systems, they, in principle, uh, are also uh, provide also vulnerabilities to the Mac OS X system. So a general attack prevention countermeasure, uh, if you remember, uh, for the uh, Starnix systems are also uh, valid to OS X. Yeah, we had a long list discussed how to, uh, how to protect uh, the Starnix system and all these methods uh, one uh, can apply also for the, O10, uh, for the uh, OS X system. Very important uh, countermeasure was disable all unnecessary services uh, be careful with the root account. Be careful with super ID bit. Use firewall. It's provided by this is upgrade the uh, packages regularly because then all these uh, uh, known uh, weaknesses, vulnerabilities uh, are fixed. So this is a general remark uh, to introduce at least two concrete uh, exploits uh, for OS X. Uh, I will introduce the Swarm OS X uh, leap.a and I will, uh, uh, I will speak about root shell exploit that was published in 2008. 
Let's start with the OS 10 slash leap.a worm to mention a very Mac OS uh, 10 specific weakness. The first information about this leap.a appeared in macrumors.com forum uh, in 2006, February 2006. And this was a very big surprise to the, uh, to the Mac uh, family, to the OS X uh, community. They were surprised because they assumed uh, that OS X has no security vulnerabilities. And the reason why they had this feeling was that in that time, the system was not very popular. You cannot compare it with today. So only designers used it, so it was a very specific uh, section of the market that worked with such an uh, OS X system. And for that reason, it was not attractive for hackers to attack such systems that are run on base of the Mac OS X system. When the Microsoft uh, systems and the operating systems become more popular, then of course, attackers uh, and hackers immediately start to search for weaknesses uh, uh, of the uh, Mac OS X system to reveal uh, vulnerabilities to develop exploits. So this was the first time there was a specific uh, Mac OS X uh, uh, malware found. The leap.a is a little bit difficult to classify. So one can, the, the, it is able, this leap.a is able to replicate itself over the network. And for that reason, we can consider that it is a worm. On the other side, to do this replication, it needs a user interaction. So as from this point of view, we have, we can consider it as a Trojan. Because you remember the worm is replicating itself without any user, uh, user interaction. What was, uh, uh, how this leap.a was implemented? The leap.a uh, uses the iChat uh, uh, IM to spread. It, replicate, it replicates itself via the send files feature of iChat. So uh, that means it sends itself to all the bodies in the contact list. The final infection after leap.a sends itself only via user interaction. So the user has to start this, uh, and, and then the, uh, the uh, spread out uh, is uh, starts of the swarm. The implementation of this leap.a worm uh, is the following. If it's spread out, the user receives a file, the file latestpix.tgs. It is received from one of the bodies in the contact list. And in this uh, file, there is a faked JPEG file, uh, lookalike uh, with height shell uh, that uh, in this uh, faked JPEG file, there is a shell script hide it. Then the script starts the infection. It adds a custom uh, input manager plugin uh, that hooks itself into iChat and replicates uh, the worm via this input manager. It also infects the most users applications from uh, Spotlight, replaces app code with own code and forks processes with original uh, app code. But fortunately, the worm was buggy. The worm itself was buggy. So the infected applications expect from iChat, so for that reason the iChat uh, was uh, seen to be uh, able to infect all the other applications didn't start uh, up anymore. So it was easy to find out because the application did not work, with the exception of iCheck, did not work 
as a result of this, uh, this leap.a attack. Uh, Abel came up with a fix uh, uh, quite fast, so the current systems are no more vulnerable uh, to uh, this attack. Let's consider a second Mac OS 10 specific attack, the root shell exploit, a root shell exploit. This weakness is, uh, more precisely, it's not a weakness, it's a bug of the Apple Remote Desktop, RID, of the Apple Remote Desktop application in this uh, Mac uh, OS 10, uh, 10.4 and 10.5, allows root access since the Apple Remote Desktop agent runs Apple scripts always with root privilege. First case of this weaknesses was reported in uh, Slashdot in 2008. And the problem is all the current systems are vulnerable uh, for this attack. What is the attack scenario? The attack scenario of this root shell exploit is that when an attacker puts a shell command, uh, puts uh, shell commands into the Apple script they are executed as root. So the Apple's remote desktop doesn't require any admin root password to do so. It can be simply reached uh, in this way. So for example, here is, an, uh, uh, is how one can get in this way uh, the possibility to perform a shell command with root writes. The answer will be root. So what are protective measures against this? Repair permissions for the Apple's remote desktop agent.app or take other ways to deactivate this Apple remote desktop agent's ability to run Apple script. Of course, then some things will not work that use this mechanism, but you are uh, defending your system against this type of attack. This concludes our lecture, our both lectures about the uh, weaknesses and targets in the operating system. We discussed Linux-based system, star NIC systems, and their weaknesses. We discussed Windows operating system as well, Windows client-side operating system as well as Windows server-side, and we discussed uh, the OS X system, and in all the system, you can find vulnerabilities that can be misused by attackers. Thank you for your attention.